And welcome to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff. Tonight, I'm your host, Joe, and with me are Aaron and Christian. And like normal, what are you guys drinking, Aaron? Well, I am actually drinking water today. I <laughs> drank a bunch last night, and the thought of having more vodka and Coke Zero makes me sick still. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Can't say I've ever been there. <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, enjoying a little bit from my last trip up to Chicago, so I have some uh, soju with me, which is that uh, rice vodka that I've had before on the podcast, and I I really love it. So nice, it, it's good stuff. And tonight I'm drinking Liquid Paradise IPA from New Belgium. And uh, yeah. Yum. So tonight we've got a few news topics for you. Uh, a couple that I'm really excited about. Um, the first one is uh, Raspberry Pi Foundation is opening up a physical store in Cambridge. Yeah. So I, I'm really excited about this, but I'm also skeptical uh, based on other maker physical stores that have opened up in the past. I'm very curious on how it's going to go for them. What do you guys think? So it looks um, super cool, and especially from the article that was published um, by them. Uh, they're doing a lot of really cool stuff uh, just from being able to come in and get stuff as well as setting up classes and stuff like that to be able to do teachings and um, little cr uh, classroom setting. So it's really cool, at least in my opinion. I am interested to hear what you have opinions on for the other stores because I have actually not been in like a maker store or any of the other kind of stores that have been in this. But this is, to me, it's super interesting and it, I really hope it works out for them. I personally think it's a bit too boutique, a bit too mm -hmm. niche, which that's what I'm worried about. Works fine for an online store, but um, for a physical store, you really need like a good market local to that store. I don't, I don't know if it's going to have the same draws like a micro center where people will drive, you know, an hour or two out of their way to go there when they can just order or buy anything off of Amazon and get two day shipping. Yeah. So. My question to go off of that, though, is like with all of the stuff that they're trying to do, could you not see potentially like schools and classroom settings partnering with these stores and offering niche classes that they normally couldn't offer at their own schools? So it's not just a store. It also becomes kind of like a community center for encouraging coding and learning. It could. Yeah, I think that's what they're going for. That's what they're really trying to push in the stores. Okay. But like MakerBot had physical stores in New York and I think they had a couple in California and it, they ended up closing after about a year um, just oh. because they were they were they were so niche. And, you know, they um, even though it was at the time when 3D printing was like super boutique and everybody wanted to see it and and go to it, it was the kind of store where you went to it once it didn't really have repeat traffic. And I worry that the Raspberry Pi store will be similar to that. Hmm. Are they going to have a genius bar? <laughs> <laughs> Man, have you ever walked by one of the big Apple stores? I it's insane. You, they sell like six things. And there's 150 people in there looking at six things. Yeah. And you know they what? Then you have to go up and you have to make an appointment and then you have to wait 45 minutes for that person to come and talk to you just because you need your Apple AirPod left earbud to be freaking fixed. Not talking from personal experience or anything. I was going to say that sounded like a personal problem. Christian. <sighs> <laughs> well, I, d I doubt that will be an issue at the Raspberry Pi store. They'll just be like, oh, here's a new one because yeah. they're, they're Raspberry Pis and they're Excellent and cheap. I'm excited. I um I'm really 
excited for all of the things that the Raspberry Pi Foundation is doing this year, coming out with all the new boards and, um, I, uh, yeah, yeah, it it looks really cool and it's pretty exciting. Aaron, you want to take the Arduino IoT thing? Yeah. So, uh, the Arduino guys actually announced their public beta for the Arduino IoT cloud. It sounds like it's essentially like the the particle cloud, if you're familiar with the particle IoT devices, where you have a nice uh, a web UI to select your Wi-Fi Arduino board, so like the Maker 1000 boards and the other Arduino boards that have built-in Wi-Fi or internet capabilities. But uh, it sounds like they're taking a step further, and you don't necessarily need to actually write any code to program an Arduino to do uh, to use some of your standard off-the-shelf components like LEDs, servos, switches, buttons. Um, they actually, oh wow, yeah, they actually gonna have a neat like drag-and-drop type interface where Ooh. you get like a little uh, a grid type thing where your your Arduino pins are, and then you just kind of drag and drop components onto them, and it will then you do like a flowchart type thing. That's a lot like Scratch, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The, the workflow feels like Scratch, even though it okay. looks nothing like it. I've been waiting for like six years for somebody to come out and do something like this. This is really neat. That is pretty awesome. Yeah. So what's awesome is that they actually, I read through some of the comments um, from the CEO who went into the the comments to answer a bunch of questions, because right now it's only for the genuine Arduino boards. Um, They don't work for any of the generics that you would buy off, you know, Amazon or AliExpress or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, How are they, they determining that? I think it's based on the, the actual microcontroller. Um, okay. I know that some of the knockoffs will have slightly different chips on them that require like an FTDI breakout to program versus just plugging in the USB yeah. cord. Um, so, to be honest, I don't fully know. Um, but he did say the support is coming for all Arduino compatible boards. You just said right now they just wanted to focus on getting it right the first time. So that's only for right now, it's just for uh, genuine Arduino boards uh, because they know they have the right encryption features on those chips, which the knockoffs may or may not actually have. So right out the gate, you you get a full TLS secure transport encryption um, on, on your device's communications between it and the Arduino cloud, which is really important um, because that's really hard to do by yourself and do it right. Yep. Um, they also handle um, web-based um, over-the-air updates, which is awesome. That's one of the reasons why I love the particle devices is that um, you can update the code from anywhere as long as it's connected to the internet. Um, they also have an automatic dashboard generation thing, so you can actually have it you know, send data to the Arduino cloud and have your own little data dashboard for your device, which is also yeah. something difficult to roll your own. No, this is really exciting because like, I'm reading a lot of this now Um, and this is going to make it way easier for me to like actually do stuff for my aquaponics aquarium. Cause although I've loved learning about Arduinos, it's, it is a tidbit intimidating, but, um, mainly with the libraries and stuff like that. But a lot of this looks like they're very much just making it a lot easier for you to start getting into IOT. This is really cool. Yeah. I should actually read the stuff we post. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> uh, so they uh, they provide several other ways to communicate with the, uh, the Arduino IoT cloud other than their base library. Um, you can use um, an HTTP REST API. They also have um, an MQTT um, feature, which is great because um, that's really popular with home automation stuff. What's uh, MQTT? Um, message queue transport something. Nice. Yes, you're welcome. I wasn't, I, I wasn't just being jabby. I really had no oh, idea what um, you were talking MQTT about. Is a, <laughs> MQTT is a pub sub, like pub, um, publish and subscribe based messaging protocol. Okay. So it's essentially just like Reddit or um, any other social media thing where you can subscribe to topics or channels and then um, you can you can then receive updates when anything publishes to those topics or channels. So with home automation, it's um, like with home assistant, it's really popular for, it's, it's a very lightweight protocol, which is why it's popular, but you could have, you know, sensors in your living room and 
they can post to like the living room topic. And then they could also then post more granular to the living room slash, you know, light sensor um, topic. So you could have mm. a post, you know, what's the ambient temperature in the living room? They'll post to that channel. Anything that's subscribed to the living room channel will get that update. And then they can react accordingly. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's really neat and it's really lightweight. And there's several different versions. There, there's a lot of different implementations of of that protocol. But yeah, it, it's 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 popular for, for uh, DIY automation stuff. But they also have command line tools for this um, IoT cloud and also um, JavaScript and WebSocket support. So we're, we're at the gate. There's a lot of neat interoperability with it. Very cool. Yeah. So then the next one is an article on Hackaday. And this isn't like maker news, but it is something that I, I identify heavily with. And it makes me angry right off the bat. <laughs> um, and uh, it's an article called uh, Make Time to Fix Your Time Debt. The first uh, sentence is, you're too busy to read more than the intro to this paragraph. We all are. And I'm just like, man, right there, I feel identified, and it makes me angry. <laughs> and, and then you know, as I'm reading through this, Aaron, you made the comment that uh, you feel like this guy's probably not married and doesn't have children. Yes. Uh, because a lot of this article makes the assumption that you have complete control over your time and uh, projects are not the only thing or projects are the only thing that are consuming you. It's a really good article, though. Yeah, so I read that. He's like, oh, you know, if family's important to you, then make sure you allot, you know, enough time for that. Oh, yeah, you know, let me just allot three or four hours of my day to my family. Like, that'll go over well. <laughs> yeah. And it's like the past couple of weeks, I've had like no time. And it, if if yeah. I if I want any time, I have to take it after nine p.m. and hey, stay up yep. late. You can tell your kid to take a number, right? They'll, yeah, she, she's totally cool with that. She's just gonna wait wait her turn. <laughs> <laughs> well, someone in the comments said that somebody told him in his life that if something is important to you, you'll make time for it. He's like, and that's true. And uh, in a lot of ways, and for a lot of people, I would agree with that. But I have officially hit a point in my life where that saying is no longer true because I have been making time for everything. And it's to the point now where they, there just isn't time to be made. Yeah. To, to fit those things in. I, I just, I, it doesn't exist anymore. And I'm getting more and more to the point where I just have to like flatly tell people no. I, I would like to help you or I would like to do that or I would like to take on this project, but I no, I, I just simply cannot. Well he addresses that in, in the article itself. Yeah. Is that, you know, as makers we tend to uh we tend to take on all the all the interesting ideas and the interesting projects because oh yeah, we could totally do that. Easy peasy. Let me just add it to the queue. Yep. Well you, like today it happened. I had someone call me. And they were like, I need you to do this thing for me. It's going to like take you just a little bit of time. And I was just like, no. And uh, I didn't say it clearly enough um, because a little bit later, they're like, I feel like you're not listening to me about my project anymore. And I was like, that's because I'm not. I I just explained to you that like all these things are happening in my life and I cannot do this thing for you. And he's like, Oh, I thought you meant that you were free and and open on your time. And <laughs> um, jeez, roll back two episodes. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, but one of the things and why I wanted to talk about this article is um, in the section called "Staying Free of Time Debt." He um, he brings up that. Uh, we can delegate tasks, we can ask for help, or we can pay others to do labor or purchase tools that save time. Like Everyone says that money can't buy happiness, but that is a bunch of crap because money can buy two things that can totally uh, make your life better. And that is to pay others to do um, make your food, so takeout and restaurants, um, you know, cooking takes time, and even though a lot of people like cooking, it takes an, an exorbitant amount of time a lot often. And uh, the other thing is uh, paying people to do housework for you. Um, 
So if, having a maid or having a house cleaner come by, I don't right now, but I used to have a house cleaner uh, that came by our house once a week. And when we, we first did it, I was completely against it. I was like, this is asinine. This is money we don't need to spend. And um, it's just, it's, it's my job to keep my house clean. And after two weeks of it, I was, I was sold because I came home and I just didn't have to be stressed about it. And it wasn't that much money. And I was totally fine with the money that was being spent because it, that was like five hours of my week. I didn't have to deal with, and I didn't have to be stressed about it. And I just, everything was better. So, um, you know, I am definitely at a point in my life where I am cool with paying for, for people to do certain things for me now. Um, cause I just, I need that time back. Yeah. So, you know, there's actually been a study that, that shows that money does buy happiness up to about $70,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And then it's very marginal after that per pe per person. So like if you're in a relationship, if you both make about $70,000 a year, that's, that's where that cap is. After that, your, your job is typically so stressful that it's like taking away from your enjoyment of your life. <laughs> yeah. Like, like a Christian. <laughs> Sorry. He's all, he's all identified. <laughs> I work for a startup, man. I feel you. It, yeah. But every time I'm like, Oh man, I could make I'm not, as not much... part of the sprint right now. Yeah, I, I, I can make as much money as I want. That doesn't mean it's going to give me any happiness. It's you got to have time to spend it. Yeah, when you work twenty four seven, three sixty five, like you don't get time to yourself. I'd rather, I'd rather have time to be able to spend with friends and family than I would make an extra ten k a year. Like, yep, it's just the way it yep. is. But. No, it, like the article itself is is a really good read. Um, and although it definitely does seem like it gives some over assumptions as to you having total control, it does give you some things to think about in your day to day to be able to just yeah. kind of prioritize towards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the most interesting things in that article was the comparison between financial stability and like time stability. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you said, you know, you can you can increase your financial situation by reducing your spending, re like reducing the outgoing money and by doing more things yourself, you know, just instead of, instead of, you know, going out to eat all the time, you can, you know, take the time to prepare your food at home. So you can see, you can, you know, save the money by spending time. And then he turns around in the next paragraph and talks about, you can save time by spending money. So it's mm -hmm. a really interesting yep. flip flop which I, it never really occurred to me before. And, and I read that. I'm like, that makes a lot of sense. Well, that was <clears throat> literally, I just did that today. And it was like, I went back to meal prepping. And so it was like, I spent all of my time. I spent about three hours doing meal prep today. Where it was like, I did all of my meals for the week, but it was like, that was three hours that I just, I could have been doing other stuff with. And it was yep. like, I had actually two people text me during that time and be like, hey, I want to hang out with you. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I have stuff in the oven right now. If you want to come over, you're more than welcome. And they're like, no, I, I really just wanted to hang out with you for a minute. I was like, sorry, I can't. Like, yeah. I, I have to do this. And I'm like. See, and alternatively, <laughs> you could have done like one of the freezer meal places and paid someone else to do the meal prep for you. Wait, do we have one of those around here? Yeah. Oh, God, there's so many. There's a lot. Oh, is there really? They're pretty popular. Yeah. It's like the new popular thing. There, and there's some really good ones. Oh, check snap. Out, <laughs> check out Eat and Evolve. Okay. Eat and wait. Evolve. You got a free plug on a podcast because your food's awesome. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm going to be distracted for about like three minutes. <laughs> Moving on to the <laughs> next news topic. Aaron found a super cool guitar made yeah. out of colored pencils. So we want to start highlighting more maker projects instead of just like techie news articles um, and people that are making really awesome stuff. And this thing's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. He, he, uh, he really took the time to not just like put a bunch of random colored pencils together. Like I've seen in other projects, but he actually like grades out 
the colors from like dark dark purple to dark blue to light blue to white and does a resin pour and it, it's just gorgeous i wish i could have time to do things that are this pretty no it's a, it's it's a super cool just like cuz he had done one like this before um this was a second one and it was like both of them are phenomenal like this dude is He's just hitting all the right notes. <laughs> Pun he's got intended. A he's got some really nice attention to detail because like, he lays out the pencils at an angle rather than laying mm. them out like straight up and down. So on the edges, they're like like uh, shooting star streaked with their ellipses. Yeah, and and good job. <laughs> yeah, like I, I've seen this um, making things out of colored pencils a lot online recently yeah. like people are making bowls and other stuff but this is the first one that really made me go wow mm -hmm. you know because because like you said it's the orient it, it's it's the the artistic expression of the card pencils not just the fact that he used them so yeah. with the angle yeah. and the the different finishing finishing of things he did like using the router to clean up the edges so you can really see how the the orientation really makes all the neat patterns and stuff. It's awesome. And of course it's like fully hand done. There's no CNC tools, which, you know, whatever. I prefer CNC tools, <laughs> but boy, he did a good job. That thing's beautiful. Yeah, this is, it's awesome. I'm sorry. I'm like, just like staring at the go around in the thing. Yeah. So the, the Imgur album has um, gifts for everything. So we're just, we're quiet because we're just watching everything go around. Is it Imger or Imger? Uh, this is another one of those moments where oh, I've never great. heard someone say it out loud and they said it different than I say it. I've always said head. Imger. Imger? No. It's Imger. I would, yeah, that's what I always thought too. Imger. Because, you know, it's an image. <laughs> I've an never imager. heard Imger. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, also I'm never... sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Unique New York. Right. No, you're right. I've never said it out loud before. It does sound stupid. <laughs> it's like all uh... of us, go, everybody for the first time talking about the Tolkien names and everybody yes. saying them all differently. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So the other day, my wife showed me a really funny meme where it was a quiz. And if the quiz was, Tolkien character or antidepressant name? <laughs> nice. I I couldn't oh, figure stamped. out literally any of them. I <laughs> it, it, any of them could have gone either way. I was lost. There there's a there's a joke website. Someone made a whole thing on it in the same vein um, for software development. It's called Big Data or Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, it's just man. big data technologies or is it a Pokemon? Amazing. <laughs> Please. All right. So that brings us to our final or our like our legitimate topic and about the right time. Not that the others um, weren't legitimate. Well, like, <laughs> OK, like just our, our, main our main topic, our main topic. All right. And our main topic is actually built off of a semi news thing. Um, mm -hmm. This week, Simplify 3D put out a newsletter and they mentioned in the newsletter that the upgrade for uh 5.0 is coming and that is going to be their first charge upgrade now uh, they didn't say how much and um they didn't specify on when or what's going to be in it and the internet lost its damn mind oh man yeah twitter lost its shit the outrage was shocking to me uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, in the Simplify 3D Terms of Service from day one, it said that you will get free updates, not upgrades, but updates for one year past your purchase date. Now, Simplify 3D has been out for going on four years, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I have had a license since the beginning. And so, you know, I'm I'm three years past my update time and I have never once been charged for an update. The other reason I was shocked is 
it's it's kind of common practice for a paid software to charge for upgrades for version upgrades so uh the fact that everyone just like completely lost their mind just boggled me i, I give it up to you guys what's your take i i'm i'm gonna come on this from the side i think because a lot of i i've said it before um i'm kind of very much as to like I saw all this news and I was like, why the heck is everybody freaking out that they're charging for software? Because I'm so used to paying like Adobe. Like mm-hmm. I've I've been on Adobe since before um Creative Cloud and I was still paying for yearly updates then. Um Man, all these software flexes going on. What's that? Are you guys flexing on how long you've been using software? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm just giving context. Just giving context. And it, it it's one of those things where it's like everybody's freaking out about this. I'm like, eh, I get it, I do, but at the same time, I'm very much like it is frustrating. It is. Take a breath. Yeah. Take a breath, Internet. Think about what you're asking. <laughs> I mean, you can't expect a company to be able to do everything for free. They've made an awesome slicing software. It really is. Um. I like when I first came into the makerspace and I was asking for what slicing software I should go with. Um, everybody at the space gave me a couple options that were free um, to start off with. And then after that, they said, if you have the money, um, this is top of the line. This is going to be what you want to use in order to actually slice stuff properly. Um, and it's going to give you your best G code output. And so yep. I did. I put the money into it because I believed in it. And it, performed and so it's like you can't expect them to just be able to support a team that made something so good for nothing so what are your thoughts aaron because i i'm going to come back with some arguments against the the charge too like i I, i'm not one way in this yeah so So i'm gonna try and keep mine short this could also be a whole there several topics but yeah my my initial response is from that of a software engineer. Throughout the history of computer programming, the cost of developing software is very front heavy. Whereas it, it's it takes a lot of money and effort to develop the software up front, and then it takes literally no money to distribute after the fact. And a lot of people feel that well, it doesn't cost you anything to just download the file. So why are you charging so much? But then they're used to software like windows or anything where you're constantly getting updates or um, they're used to this new wave of free and open source software where you know the community is doing the development for because they really want this thing to exist and to be better they're Mm -hmm. doing it out of the kindness of their hearts so they're people are putting volunteering their own time to make software but then people see that and now they expect every other piece of software to be cheap or free yeah, like I said, it can go it can go lots of different ways. In the world of slicing software, um, is it the community doing the development for free? It depends. Well, the the comparisons that are currently getting made are um, Idea Maker and Kira and Slicer, uh, specifically Slicer uh, PE edition or Slicer PE with Russia edition. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, I think those are those are the three main things that main ones that are people are going after. No monkey print. Uh, no, nobody uses monkey print because monkey prints <laughs> resin only. And, you know, it's not very good. Um, it could. It, well, it, you know, it could be. But nobody knows what it is. Dude, I work with Fair software enough. and I could not get it installed. <laughs> Put it that way. So. Um, so I can say with 100% certainty that two of those slicers are not community developed. They are open source, but their their developers are getting paid because they are on payroll for printer based companies. So the revenue for that software is backed by printer sales. It's backed by hardware sales. And that's the slicer Prusa edition and uh, Kira. And Kira is getting it from two directions because Ultimaker is funding the uh, like Kira original flavor. And then Lulzbot is 
funding the development for Lowell's, Kira Lulzbot edition. So, you know, those aren't community developed, you know, for the love of them. They are, you know, somebody's full time job is developing those software. Somebody's getting paid. Right. That's been a whole uh, discussion in the overall field of open source software, too. It's just just because you can download the software for free doesn't mean it didn't cost anything to make. And right. when you're doing that, like, for instance, when my company uses an open source library um, that saves work, you know, you're just offloading the cost. Yeah, is what it is. So th that cost is being paid somewhere. It just may or may not be you. And in this case, th the argument is, you know, where should the cost be? Just to go back to that real quick, Idea Maker is Ray's 3D's slicer. I, I have yet to use it. I am downloading the install right now because I've heard good things. But, you know, that's another one that is hardware backed. And Simplify 3D is a standalone software. No yeah. hardware maker is backing that. So you know, their funding is 100% from their software sales. They yeah. don't have a donation page. You know. uh, and like you said, Aaron, the, the open source software that is free, um, that in the 3D printing world, things like Octoprint, like Marlin, like the RipRap firmware, like those guys are all getting backing from both donations and hardware companies. Like Octoprint is backed by Lulzbot. It's backed by a couple other companies. And then um, Gina herself has a Patreon and donation backers. I'm one of them, you know, that like have sent her money to fund her project. Like the, the money is coming from somewhere. Like, people are eating based on the software. I think that's an important thing to remember when you get upset about somebody wanted to make money off of a software project. Well, it's this, it, man, I'm going to sound like I'm old saying this. It's this ease of, um, ease of accessibility, um, society that we've got ourselves into people like we've gotten this into. It's so on demand that people just expect it. Mm -hmm. And that's become a problem because people are very much no longer, <sighs> Willing to understand that, like, yeah, people are trying to make a living off of this, and they just expect it to be handed to them. And there's there's a lot of examples of that. Um, and it's not only affecting this. I personally, I also feel like it's affecting creativity in its own way, where people are just asking for things to be done rather than exploring the option of doing it themselves. And yeah. that's kind of sad. Now, uh, on the other side where people are frustrated about it and I think they have legitimate frustrations is um, Simplify itself hasn't been very good to its user community. Um, if you go try to find documentation on Simplify scripting engine, for example, it doesn't exist. And it's hmm. not for lack of people asking for it. I'm one of them. I've been asking for a simple guide that tells me what the variables are that are broken out and how they're used in their scripting engine since version two. And it has yet to be released. Um, in, in the same light in the last year, there has been one update made and uh, two, two, if you count the bug fix for what they broke in version four <laughs> and the version four release wasn't very good. It, it actually regressed a number of things in um, in their ability to slice things well. So, it, I that's where I think some of the frustration lies is like Simplify just hasn't been very good to its customers. Uh, but at the same time, like if they're gonna fix this stuff in five, and they're not going to charge you an entirely new license fee. Maybe it's worth it. Maybe maybe supporting the engineers that have put the effort out for the last four years is, is worth it. I don't know. I will say that a lot of this, especially coming in, because I'm, I'm going to also swing on the other side as well. Um, what a lot of this feels like is almost the how YouTube did their uh, upgrade for premium um, oh, back when it was called the Red. And it was like they put all of these features that everybody has been wanting for years behind this paywall. 
It was yeah. like background music was one of the things that everybody's been asking for literal years. And it's not a function that requires a whole lot of development. It literally is just, hey, play this when I shut my screen off so I don't have to be constantly keeping my phone on. Um, yeah. Like that is that is not a feature that needs super developed on for either yeah. platform. And they put it behind a so paywall. Much. What's that? I get that so much. <laughs> it I, can't be that hard, can it? <laughs> I mean, granted, I'm not the one developing. I, I'm not. I will, I will say I do not know what went into that code. Um, from a small basis of knowing code, I would say that that feature itself does not seem like it is overly demanding. And that's what I kind of feel like is happening with Simplify is there's a lot of things that they started pointing towards. They're like, hey, you've been asking for this for forever and we're finally going to do it. And it's like, yeah, but why didn't you do it in the first place? Why do I have to now pay again in order to get this when this should be something that like if you were truly listening, why were you not putting this in earlier? If you but like. Yeah, go ahead, but go ahead. in the in the terms of service, it, it's an upgrade like it, they are going full version. Yeah. So, you know, and, you know, for me, I've been getting three years of free updates. So, like, I'm definitely due. Yeah. And you know, there. I, the terminology like is kind of kills it like there's updates which to me is a, is a dot one dot one five dot two dot and then there's upgrades which is a full a full jump you know four to five five to six and yeah. oh, i was just gonna say coming from the cad world um you know those upgrades are are usually very expensive <laughs> you know thousands of dollars so like paying 20 bucks to get to version two or version five doesn't seem like it would be that bad. I don't know if it's $20 or a hundred dollars, okay. but no, that was going to be the thing I asked was like, one, do we know the price? Cause I didn't see that listed at all in anything. Um, and then two, would there be a discount for people who have already bought the software? If it's, if it's going to be like 60 bucks, totally okay with that. If it's going to be full price all over again, that I might have a problem with. Yeah. And and people are also acting like their current software is going to stop working. Yeah. And it's not. If you're happy with it as it sits, just ignore it and you know, be happy with, with the software that you have. Right. I think with, when it comes to software, people kind of take the same sort of expectations as they would a hardware product. I think if I say that right, no, that's that's or, that's or, a fair or maybe it's different. They, they expect it to be different. If you buy a widget, you know, you get that widget, and the widget works as intended for its expected lifetime. Um, the company may come out with widget 2.0. Should you get widget 2.0 for free, or you buy right. a whole, or you buy the new version of the widget? Right. But um, just. I think we're at a turning point in, in the software industry where every, everything's going towards, you know, um, service um, subscription based. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a much more uh, sustainable model for software because, you know, especially if it's if it's a software product that you do get up that that will get updated throughout its lifetime, then that that those updates do require, you know, development costs. Yeah. Right. And you can't just live off of a single payment. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, you know, it's like um, you brought up Adobe uh, earlier, Christian, and like you didn't get CS six for free when when you had CS five. No, you know, and, and they did that every year. Yep, and you know like, that just that was just how it went, and you know there was a reason for that. There's development costs, and like they gotta pay people, and people, I I hate it. But people only work when there's money involved. Companies yeah. run to make money. They don't run to make the world better. And it's stupid and I hate it. But <laughs> at the same time, I get it because I wouldn't go to work if they didn't pay me. Right. So. Ah, stupid economics. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Always getting in the way. Damn capitalism. 
<laughs> yeah. No, nah, it, like, it it is, it's something that, like, really you have to, or I, I think, especially when it comes to software, there's almost too much in the background um, that mm-hmm. happens without people being able to see it. Um, like, you're, you're not going to go to your, to your baker or to your local pizza shop and curse them out for charging you to make them a pizza. Like, there's, there is work there. You have to expect that, like, these people also need to, they also need to survive, like, and they can't do it for nothing. Well, what about my artist friend that I like his oh, art a dude. lot and we're friends? Like, should I pay him? No, you should just completely tell him to do everything for free. And because they know how to take a photo, they should take a photo of you. And you can use that as your portfolio photo. It's really easy. And, like, it doesn't take him very long. And I can show so many people that how good of a picture they took. Oh, yeah. And they already have the equipment. And they... Yeah, they, they, they got all of it down, man. They got all these and I, oh, I, I'm sure they got a discount on that equipment and it was like, you know, nothing, right? Oh, no. They they totally didn't have to take out student loans to try and get that. And they're trying to make ends meet to be able to do anything like that. That was all just given to them. Like, yeah. And like, yeah. I'm that's like not legitimately how they're raging on the inside. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's get back on topic. But we are on topic. We're totally on topic. And that's the point. <laughs> like, people are expecting all of this out of you, Aaron. Like, yeah. you're a software developer and everyone expects, like, you. It's not that big of a deal. It's not that hard to add that background streaming function, right? I'm also guilty of doing that to myself as well. <laughs> well, I mean, when we do it to ourselves, it's because, like, it sounds interesting and it doesn't sound that hard at the time. I yeah. Yeah, I do it all the time, too. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, when it's voluntary and you want to challenge, like, that's the whole thing. But it, it all comes to when people expect it of you and, like, mm-hmm. and, and creating this environment of just, like, expectations and demand. That's... Yeah. Bullcrap. Unreasonable expectations in the maker world. We should, we should do an episode Man. on that. <laughs> you want to go back a couple episodes, listen to our Seagal. Please do. <laughs> oh, man. So so, I, really, I really like how Lightburn does their licensing, which is you pay, yeah. you pay uh, a certain amount up front for like the current version. Mm-hmm. And then you get, I don't think they currently have it fully figured out yet, but annually there'll be an upkeep charge to kind yeah. of keep your license up to date and it's nowhere near the cost of the full version. But yeah. that that reoccurring that small reoccurring cost helps fund continual development. Yeah. And that's like one of the other things that I I think blew my mind as to why so many of these people got upset was I would say for most of us, most of us are pretty geeky, um, especially in this world. It's like Motherfucker, do you not remember every expansion from WoW that came out and we had to drop another 60 for that? Like, <laughs> this Destiny. is not new. Destiny, <laughs> like, the, like, it, you're flipping out because they let it go for so long. And yeah. maybe that's on them. I don't know. It, like, it, it's up to them that they created this environment for something like this to happen. But it's like, it's not new. Like, yeah, this this happens everywhere. And and to be clear, I'm not defending Simplify 3D in in this episode. No. They they dug their hole by doing four years of free updates and poor customer communication and all that stuff. But what I am frustrated with is the way the maker community reacted and the entitlement that was apparent in the Twitter responses and the Facebook responses that really frustrated me. This is something that I want to talk more about, but before people get on a tirade, I'm not defending simplify for their actions. I don't actually really like simplify that much. Uh, It frustrates me. And uh, I always have trouble making decent prints out of it when I can make wonderful prints out of Kira and Slicer and everything else. But at the same time, 
I do feel like they deserve to make money. And I feel like they have a reasonable commercial model for keeping their business running, especially when you look at other commercial CAD softwares. Like they are a commercial slicing software. That's that's why they're not free. Like they offer things it, that only commercial users really need. So that's why I bought it. I think we definitely need to revisit this topic. I think we've done it several times, but I think we can expound upon this in many different ways. Um, yep. When it comes to maker entitlement and uh, just the current maker environment that is kind of like this. You want to come on and complain about software and um, purchasing agreements and things like that? We'd love to have you on. <laughs> we need to set up like a, a, a voicemail for people to be able to call in and yell and then we'll play them. <laughs> caller one. <laughs> ooh, ooh, we should have a call in episode. That'd be real fun. That would. All right, guys. What else you got? You have anything else? I mean, I could talk for another hour on uh, on revenue models for open source software. Maybe that'll be our next episode. Yeah, and that is something I would like to explore because that is something. It's a huge challenge. Every every time that we talk about it, everybody goes, "Well, you can't make money with open source." And sure, not easily. You can. Yeah, like you're going to get stolen from open source. Like you should never go open source. And I I would love to talk more about that with you because you have looked into that very much and you are very versed in that. So I would love to just poke your brain on that one as well. So with that, um, I think I'm done. You guys have anything else to add? Nope. Nope. Rad. This was a fun episode. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, if you have anything for us, as always hit us up on the social medias, makers on tap on Reddit, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh gmail um uh, that's that's everything um yep. and uh you know with that keep on making stuff this is the end of the podcast there it is as 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 as